Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Pop Off PC Max Premier Gaming Podcast. My name is Zachary Cuevas, and today we have a very special guest with us. Now, gamers of a certain age may recognize him from his long, luscious locks, but gamers young and old will know him from his extensive contributions to the video game industry as a whole, with a portfolio that includes iconic first-person shooters like Wolfenstein 3D, Doom, Quake, and yes, even Dai Katana. His latest release is an autobiography about all that and more called Doom Guy, My Life in First Person, available at bookstores by the time you're watching this. Ladies and gentlemen, the father of the FPS, the icon of sin, the Doom Guy himself, Mr. John Romero. John, welcome hey. to the pop off. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on. That's really a great intro. <laughs> <laughs> I've been working all week on it, so I'm glad nice. you liked it. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little nervous. I don't think I've ever uh, interviewed someone, um, you know, so high profile. So excuse me if I'm if I'm cheesing or I'm just blushing. Interview, but, um, but John, yeah. Um, Thanks for coming on the pop off and um and so yeah you wrote a whole book doom guy uh yeah. an autobiography your life in first person um and John I guess I just want to jump right into it so um over the years you know there's been there's been countless um books and articles about id software and the creation of doom and your own career um but uh when writing this when writing your autobiography was there a desire to um you know tell your story and set the record straight on certain things because there's a lot of there's there's been tons of of stories around you know you almost have a fabled presence in the industry <laughs> yeah i mean there's there's been a lot of stuff written but this book is not about setting any kind of record straight mm -hmm. i'm just saying here's my life uh from the beginning to now and here's what happened uh and, uh, you know, I remember it all. So I'm, I'm basically putting it out there and um, just kind of telling my story. Yeah. And I mean, your story uh, starts, um, I mean, I feel like uh, your story starts in a place that I don't think a lot of people expect. And uh, perhaps um, I think that a lot of people don't share your background. It was, a, you had a bit of a tumultuous early life, I guess, put it lightly. Um, and I mean, I don't think people have that type of life, especially uh, designers uh, as prolific as you are. But um, do you think that do you think those that early upbringing, that rough upbringing um, shaped the way you see games and how you develop them? Uh, yeah, I'd say definitely, you know, all of somebody's experiences help shape who they are. And for me, <clears throat> you know, going through the stuff I went through. Um, I spent a lot of time in my own head um, in playing video games. And I just spent a lot of time thinking about that stuff. And, uh, you know, like I didn't have any money, obviously, <laughs> back in the <laughs> early days. So uh, coming from that kind of background, I had to make my own fun. You know, you get used to making your own stuff when you don't have toys and all that. Um, and uh, that's, you know, certainly uh, part of my career is, is making stuff, you know, kind of turned yeah. into that. So I got used to doing that, and I tried to get really good at doing it, and I uh, just kept doing it. And you're you're self taught. I mean, this is like, I mean, when you're um, you write about how you were kind of sneaking into uh, the local college and sort of like looking over the shoulder of other college students as they learn to code and program, which is kind of like a crazy thing to think of. I feel like um, those those kids, those college students must have been so nice to you. I feel like, I, I don't know if that would happen today, but how was it like? Because that is, if when I read about the 80s and uh, <laughs> the 80s in general, but when I read about like game development in the 80s in particular, it feels like it's like the Wild West, you know? It was extremely Wild West. Yeah. Uh, I mean... At the very beginning, you know, it's just books. You have to have the right books to understand anything. There was no internet. So if I didn't have books, I couldn't really do anything but play around and see what happened on a computer. Luckily, when I was in the uh, computer science lab at the at the um, the local college, there were students who were programming. And I asked them enough questions that they just handed me the basic programming book for that mainframe. <laughs> And that's what let me, you know, helped me a, a much faster actually having a book and and reading it and using that information and seeing what came out of it and starting to form ideas about games and starting to write those down. And it's funny, when I 
think just as I was living my life, I never thought about any of that stuff before and how weird it must look from like a high level viewpoint. But when writing my book and looking at everything, it's like, okay, so when I was 11, I went to a college and I taught <laughs> myself how to program on a mainframe computer. <laughs> totally, totally normal activity. How does that happen? I can't, how does that ever happen? <laughs> That's not normal for anybody. And it's like almost impossible nowadays. Like they don't even have mainframes right. really in most computers. Right. And yeah. and I mean, um, also there are there are home computers and home game, uh, like a game console was so uncommon then. And um, you only had the arcade if you wanted to play games. So this was also not only just another way for you to play games, but like to discover games that you wouldn't normally find in arcade, uh, an arcade, right? It definitely the games that were in the arcades were the best games right like they were, <laughs> right they had hardware made to you know <laughs> created to make them as great as they were and when home computers came out they had cpus and you know they were designed to to just be general purpose so a lot of games on home computers were not never as great as the arcade counterparts or the ones that they were kind of copied about uh copied from but even on the mainframe that's like a text-based video screen yeah and those those games were were made to be nothing like the arcades they were turn-based games which like arcades don't take turns it's you're, yeah, right. you're, you're just trying to eat your quarter as fast as possible so the turn-based games was so different and that really opened up my mind to what game design could be right well so i guess to that point what were some of your earliest influences i mean you write of course there's stuff like space invaders and pac-man that are like classics i think everyone of that time would claim that but oh what were some of your earliest influences then well when i was on the mainframe computer it was definitely the text-based games like star trek and uh hunt the wumpus which was really a fun one <laughs> poison cookie which is an early minesweeper type game but really, Colossal Cave Adventure was the one that was the coolest game yeah. on a mainframe. And when I started to teach myself how to code, I started to teach myself how to try to write games that were like adventure, where you had a room and a description and ways to, you know, things that you could type in to go to different rooms. And then as I got on the, you know, as I get my own computer at home, you know, years later, um, it was, you know, it was like nonstop learning and coding. And, yeah. uh, and it was super amazing and and just being exposed to a bunch of i, I actually played games on other computer systems back then because the atari 800 came out in 79 so i was i got i got onto that pretty quickly mm -hmm. uh just to, to check that out and one of the really cool games on that was mule uh which was written by danny perry who was an early pioneer in multiplayer games and it was really important for me to have exposure to multiplayer games back then because most games were single player it's easier right. to write a single player game but getting exposure to a multiplayer game like the, the one that danny berry had written was really important yeah. but you know back then it wasn't just the designs of the games it was very much the programming and the hardware of the computers back then that was critically important to understand and so there were some amazing uh programming mentors that i looked up to like nasser jabelli and bill budge and dan gorland and uh, Larry Miller and people like that. So there's there's a hundred names I could name from these awesome <laughs> programmers back in 1980, 81, 82. Yeah. Um, you know, in designers as well. And it's such a, I mean, uh, such a small community at that time. So it was like, you, uh, you know, they were they were so niche. So it was it was kind of cool to um, to learn that like you know it's just like one person. Like I mean, now a game is made with hundreds of people uh in the studio but it was just like one guy on one computer <laughs> it's all you yeah need, that's amazing <laughs> is it was the the game industry was built by indies from the very yeah. beginning right but i mean uh and like you know id software itself was kind of like such a major in, independent studio uh, in the early 90s but and i like that your influences are so far reaching um because you know id's first hit and i guess your first hit was was not a first person shooter it wasn't wolfenstein it wasn't doom it was commander keen which exactly is, right and I, I i while i was researching john um you know pc mag 
we're 40 years old, 45 years old or something. So we actually, I was able to pull some older reviews and I got a uh, Commander Keen was one of the earliest games we reviewed. And uh, we famously said it was an arcade game, an arcade game that offers Nintendo style action with scrolling graphics. Now I want to talk about Commander Keen's origins. Cause like, uh, you know, it's kind of a goofy, um, it's sort of like well, copyright infringement that led to this platformer on the PC. Yeah, it was, um, I was, I had started making some platform games before we made Commander Keen. Um, in fact, it's kind of funny, just before we started working on Keen, I had just made in one month a platform game and put it out for free. And it was called Dangerous Dave. Yes. And that game <laughs> has ended up being more popular in India and Pakistan than Doom even, because it was installed on every computer sold in those countries for decades. That's Unbelievable. Insane. So yeah, it's uh, pretty cool. But the um, the copyright infringement disc that you talked about is is a, a disc that was a, a demo created by Tom Hall and John Carmack late at night to basically uh, as a joke to show me this cool tech that Carmack had just done, which right. I challenged him. I challenged him to do this technology, <laughs> and he did it. And they put they they did it. You know, from ten to five a.m. And they put it on my desk and they went home and I came to work and I saw it and it was just to blew my mind. <laughs> and that disc is one of the most interesting relics in, in, I think, most of the game industry, because that disc has the first engine on it and it has the beginnings of its software, which then created the FPS and everything right. came from that. So that disc represents the reason why its software started and everything that came after it. So um, it's a really great example also of a team working together because I challenged Carmack to do this. Tom came in and did all the work to, he came up with the idea to use Super Mario 3 and mash up Dangerous Dave and make a right. joke out of it. Carmack had all the technical ability to make that thing happen within hours. And then when I saw it, that on my end was like, we need to start a company and get out of here because this will change everything. And so <laughs> this teamwork that we had together is why we started the company and it worked out really well. Yeah. And you were absolutely right when you saw that and you were like, this is, this is something special because that led to Wolfenstein 3D. And so that was, um, I mean, now for Wolfenstein 3D, that's actually one of the first games I played and I, on my, on my dad's work computer, and I didn't even know what, I didn't know what Get Psyched meant. I must have been like five <laughs> or six, you know, just like yeah. shoot Nazis and just going through that same, just going through the same like first floor over and over again. But that was yep. like crazy. And so, well, Wolfenstein uh, was so big when it released. And in fact, um, uh, the pop-off, our pop-off host, Jordan Miner, who couldn't be here today, he um, wrote about Wolfenstein and chose it as the um, best game, of the most important game of 1992. Um, but Wolfenstein 3D uh, is really the first modern first-person shooter. There were, you can argue there were first-person shooters and first-person-like games then, but uh, Wolfenstein, Wolfenstein's DNA is still found in a Call of Duty and a Halo and, and, you know, so, and then, you know, the releases that followed. So um, tell me about the creation of Wolfenstein. Cause I, and you write about it and Wolfenstein is a little weird. Uh, it's well, not exactly your, like Wolfenstein was a game you bought. You bought the rights to Wolfenstein, right? We bought the name of Wolfenstein. Yeah. Because um, there was a 1981 Apple II game that came out in 1980, it came out in 1981, obviously. Yeah. Uh, written by Silas Warner, which ended up being the first stealth game made. And it was such a massive, huge success. It's a classic game yeah. for the Apple II. And all of us uh, edited software. I mean, there was only four of us. Three of us, actually. <laughs> <All four. laughs> Three of us. Yeah, there's only four. <laughs> Three of us lived in Wolfenstein for years back in the early 80s. So um, in 1992, uh, when we were basically making a third trilogy of Commander Keen games, I had just kind of had enough of it. And at like <laughs> one in the morning, I just told the guys, dudes, I don't want to make this anymore. I can't believe we're not going and making more first person games. This is the future, not side scrolling shit. We need to make first person games. Right. We didn't have shooter was not really a thing. Right. It, it was three, that 3D, right? didn't even exist. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't even exist. So, so, um, 
Tom, they mentioned immediately was just like, yeah, that's right. You know? And so they like, they agreed. And, uh, and it's like, well, what are we going to do? And, 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 and I basically said, we should remake Wolfenstein, Castle Wolfenstein. And they're like, oh my God. Yeah. Like it was immediate. I'm sure like everyone's light bulbs went off on everyone. Yeah. Whoa. (laughs) And the thing, and we didn't know we were going to use the name. We just knew that was the game that we wanted to make a 3D version of. So while we're developing the game, we're coming trying to come up with other names we could call the game. Nothing was as cool as Wolfenstein. (laughs) So we eventually ended up looking for the trademark and buying the trademark for the name and everything uh, before we release the game. Uh, But we only made the game in four months, so we had to do it pretty quickly. It's so nuts that when you say that, like, you know, oh, yeah, we I did this in a month. Or I did this in four months. Two guys, three guys, one month, whatever. We we revolutionized the industry. Oops. It was like total, like, a real, like, lightning in a bottle situation. Um, But, yeah, Wolfenstein 3D um led to, of course, the big one. I mean, you know, the book has it in yeah. the title <laughs> um so that led to the creation of doom and um which a uh, pc mag's technical excellence award winner of 1994 beating mist and microsoft flight simulator two equally important i think i think very important games in those times but doom um like when i was when i was reading your book i didn't realize how much had stemmed from doom you know like you know first person shooters were like kind of like this is like the primordial phase but like from terminology multiplayer and modding all of that kind of like stems from from doom uh and i mean even uh, allegedly there was a level uh made of the pc mag office at the time that was a <laughs> that was a doom wad. So I mean, just tell me about the creation of Doom. Like I mean, so many lightning in the bottle moments. How do you stumble from Keen to Wolfenstein to the heavy metal masterpiece Doom? <laughs> well, first I like to say now that I can say it in person, thanks PC Magazine for choosing <laughs> the Technical Excellence Award for us in nineteen ninety four. I was like, I wonder. I was wondering if John had even known about. The, I know PC Mag's mentioned in the in the book, but I don't know if you like ever saw these reviews. At yeah, the time. yeah. <laughs> I've actually I've actually done a deep dive on awards for all the games that I made, and so yeah. it's definitely in there. PC Magazine is in there, <laughs> and yeah, you know, every one of our games. Um, a lot of the games that we made, we thought of like immediately. They were very quick. They were they were not like let's think for a month about what we're gonna make. It was like we got two months to make this game. Boom. And yeah. so you know, with with Wolfenstein, it was the first time we made a game that didn't have a deadline on it. You know, but we we're still rushing to make it like we we're like usual. So we took right. twice as much time and did four months with that. But when Doom started, you know, we knew that after Wolfenstein, and we made Spirit Destiny right after that, which is like a prequel. And that got us in stores. Um, we knew that the next game was 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 because uh, it's going to be better, and we could put more into it because we're getting better at making these three D games, right? So at that time, uh, Doom was our fifth uh, shooter. Spear Destiny was, or sorry, yeah, Doom was our fifth shooter. So Spear Destiny was our fourth, and we had modified the Wolfenstein technology to be even better than what people have seen in Spear right. Destiny and Wolfenstein. But it just didn't give us that next level, like, blow you away kind of moment. So John Carmack decided he needs to come up with an entirely brand new technology. And at the same time that he thought about that, we were also deciding to not use the PC to develop a game anymore. We decided that we we're going to use Next Step Workstations, right. which which today is what Mac OS is, right? So this is back in the very early days. So we all got these next stations and DOS machines and we basically decided, okay, here's the, here's the list of all the technology that we want to put into this game. And, and then it was like, okay, now we're, what are we going to do with this badass engine that we're making? Um, So we'd start thinking about the, the things that we could create around the technology um that we were planning on on putting in and then the design is like oh and modify the technology because we have some better ideas like yeah hey what if we could all play together okay multiplayer technology add that to the list um and 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 while we're coming up with these ideas at some point it was like we need to we need to think when wall make a design in this game we need to think that that like we need to make the best game that we can imagine playing because with 
because we think that we can do that. We have the ability to make the best thing that we can imagine playing. And that was the only time that we ever did that on any of our games is to make that statement. So we did we did this crazy list of of features, one of them, like the last one of which is an open game for everybody to mod and change to to be anything that they wanted. Um it, 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 in, in addition to multiplayer, deathmatch, high speed land play, like no game did that ever, right? Yeah. So it was like all this cool stuff. So before we even started working on the game in early January of 1993, we put out a press release <laughs> saying to the world that we are revolutionizing PC games and are making the best game in the world. And we expect <laughs> productivity on the planet to be decreased <laughs> before we even start writing the game. What? I, that was. I, crazy <laughs> yeah it's, it's, and then and you're like where we're gonna we're gonna you know we're gonna make the best game in the world expect us <laughs> yeah exactly it's like oh hey everybody you have a year to try and catch up like yeah <laughs> we were hoping to finish it in a year you know like but we didn't have a deadline on it but like we started getting antsy around christmas so right we were hoping that we would get it done by then and that was such a cool like i mean like in a perfect world that's that's how game development should be this like ouroboros of like design uh design and technology, technology like exactly sort of like informing each other it, through the whole process and um and i mean you've got this masterwork doom and you're, you're doing stuff that never had been done uh and i mean what was like what was it i mean you you were confident but were you truly like i mean four guys we, we could do this in a few months how were, were you were you sweating were you, I don't, you know, were you losing your mind in this time? So we we had five people making Doom. Right, right. <laughs> so you, got, so, you, had to, you had to call it back up, the one extra guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the thing is, we were, we worked perfectly together. Like, we were so in sync. We absolutely knew that we could do it. We knew that, that after all of the games that we had made, like, by the, by the way, up until this point, I think... That we'd made 17 games together already in software within uh, three years, th two and a half years, mm -hmm. let's say, 17 games. Um, so we knew that if we spent all of our time on one game to make it the best thing that we could ever imagine, yeah. that we could do this. And we were also, the plan for that new engine was so far ahead technology-wise, and the design was going to be innovative. We we're going to work more on pushing this fast 3d gunplay right that was that was critical to keep the focus on that and remove obstacles that kept it from being amazing like with wolfenstein getting rid of lives getting rid of or sorry yeah wolfenstein did have lives and score doom got rid of those concepts yeah. because it's like what is the goal the goal is for players to get through the game and have fun not to yeah. stop them and make them restart you know so get rid of lives and what are we picking things up for for score? We're trying to survive in an environment and to make it more realistic, <laughs> get, get rid hell. of garbage. <laughs> yeah, get, exactly. We're just going to have to burn ourselves through hell. So we could push each other. We had no limits on what we could do. Um, and we were so good at scoping anything that we made that we 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 had that feature list. And it's like, we can do all those things. In prop, We didn't even say it was going to be a year, but we kind of felt, that's yeah, probably going to be a year. <laughs> and we just slammed into it. And, you know, we did hit, uh, you know, stumbling blocks along the way, like like needing to create the binary space partition mm -hmm. to render the screen faster because it was too slow using like a sector list data structure. And I I found that problem when I was making some part of E1M2. And John immediately came up with a solution. It was just like days before he came up with taking this white paper that he'd read from an AT&T researcher and turning this thing that had nothing to do with levels and making it work with levels to be super fast render. And so it was like amazing. Then it was like, uh, what are the levels going to look like? We, the, we have a, we have an engine that can make us the, the stuff on the screen that no one's ever seen before. We have to creatively figure out how to maximize the technology that we are putting into the game. And that was actually really tough because we had never seen examples of any games that looked like Doom because before Doom, every maze game had 90 degree walls and right. corridors, right? Every game, there was nothing that looked like Doom. So it was like, how do we get out of this design box yeah. that we and everybody else were in? 
And it was a lot, it was a lot of thinking about instru- and ch- testing and all that. One day I finally just said, I'm going to solve this because we have to move ahead fast in design. And I just spent some time thinking about this one specific room and using all of the different data and the features to do something that we hadn't done yet in our, des- in our designs. And so when I created the room, it might, it looks really simple today, but back then it was like a world change or world change for us. And I brought everybody into my office and said, here's what I'm talking about. Places that look like this and have this kind of stuff. And everyone's like, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so that's when the abstract level design style was invented. And, and we kind of ran with it, making the levels. And we got even better at that while making Doom 2. But yeah, we, we, we knew we could do it. We knew we could do it and that we would overcome any issues that we were going to have because we'd been making games for 13 years at that time. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of overcoming issues, John, um, there was one issue you overcame and you had to actually get in there, right? You had to, like, take your shirt off and, and do some modeling <laughs> for for the, I guess now it's like, kind of like that iconic, like, Doom pose of, like, you know, the Doom guy kind of shooting stuff and getting grabbed <laughs> at by these demons. And that's you, right? Yeah. So the cover artist, he did the logo first. He did the Doom logo, yeah, the, the right? the 3D text, yeah. Yeah, he did that cool logo first. Then it was like, okay, we need to do the box. So we called Dun Punch Hats. Uh, even though he did the logo, it's like, he can also do the box. He's a badass illustrator. So we called Dun Punch Hats over. He brings a guy who is the model. And I'm supposed to just tell him what poses this guy should be in for possible cool, you know, you know, dynamic poses for the right. cover. Like, what could the hero guy, the space marine, be looking like on the cover? And so this guy was just trying to tell the guy what to do, and he just didn't, wasn't moving around and, like, posing in the way I was thinking of. And so I just finally said, let me do it. Here, get up. Let me do it. You're going to be a demon. And so I just <laughs> – I ripped off my shirt, and <laughs> – <laughs> and then I'm like, okay, you grab my arm, like you're a demon over here. And then I give me one of the guns. I got like one of our fake guns that we were using, yeah. like the BFG. And I'm just like pointing it. And so then Don's like taking all these photos. And so was, that was it. That was the cover. <laughs> you don't add, you, don't, you never add model to your list of accomplishments. I know. John. I know. <laughs> yeah. I was totally used to ripping my shirt off. I mean, yeah. we, we, that, we that was how the were time. settled then. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, but so yeah, Doom. Um, so modding, right? So, um, I think it was. Um, I mean, the way you guys uh, commu- like built your ties with your community, and that was a big way was through modding. Um, what were some of your? I mean, you hired people uh from the modding community you know you'd see like these excellent mods and you you bring people on or even some other studios like there was very almost like a quid pro quo sort of like okay you come over like we'll help you out if you come and develop a, a map pack for us but like um what was your um do you have any like favorite do mods or um because i mean i feel like the id engine showed up in a lot of places even the wolfenstein engine i mean i'm sure you probably ran into the uh, noah's uh adventure uh <laughs> or the checks mix first person shooters but like what would you yeah. do you have a, uh, some of your favorites like the oddest you've come across well one of the one of the one of the early standouts for me is um it's called uac dead mm-hmm. and the level in there is pretty normal up until a certain point and it, at this one point you go into this building that is like almost pitch black and it has uh it has these these uh, candles basically floating in the air going up and it's a staircase, but it's invisible. You can't see any textures there. And it's a really crazy room. And the guys, <laughs> the person who made it is pulling all kinds of sector tricks and line death tricks. And, uh, and it was like, wow, you can do this. Like we, we didn't, <laughs> we, we never had, like we could, we could have modified the, I could have modified the tools that I wrote to make the levels to allow us to do that but what was really important was that the levels actually were were like they cre- they, they were like making they were safeguarding the data so bad things couldn't happen sure and <laughs> this person was on purpose doing bad things that looked cool and you couldn't tell right so it was like <laughs> the rule well, of cool yeah <laughs> yeah but but yeah that was one of the coolest ones also the star wars one was amazing yeah. the uh the the alien one i think it was aliens probably that was super scary. It was really well done. <laughs> uh, Doom Marine was awesome, trying to make it a, like more of a milsim kind of game. Yeah. 
Um, and now today, myhouse.wad. I I saw you play incredible. my house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. And I barely played any of it. I thought I played the, okay, well, that's over. Nope, that was 5%. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember I, I watched the stream of yours a few years ago and I just watched your face. And went, oh, yeah, it's a, it's a house. Oh, yeah, it looks normal. And then just like kind of like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like it's just getting bigger and bigger. Um, and so, um, to that, uh, in that same vein, um, Doom has sort of, uh, you know, Doom's almost like, um, can be played anywhere on anything, right? Yeah. You can, you can run Doom on your scientific calculator, on your phone, on your Xbox. Where's the wildest place you've seen Doom? Well, obviously the pregnancy test. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know about this. I didn't know about the pregnancy test Doom thing. I don't even yeah. know how that would even work. It's a little black and white pixel screen on it. The latest one that I've seen beyond like later than the, the pregnancy test, because that was like a year ago, <laughs> is a CPU cooler display. Really? Like, there's, yeah, there's like a CPU cooler. <laughs> it, so you have to like look inside your computer and there's a little round screen that Doom is on running. That's that's amazing. <laughs> I yep. keep saying, I keep pitching, I keep pitching a video. We got to get like, go into the office and get Doom running on as many things as we can. The smart fridge, the TV, everything, you know, our, our, yeah, our, no. our watches. Toaster. To. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, okay, so fast forward. Um, and again, it's I, these 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 turnarounds are always so shocking it's by today's standards right but was it like 11 months later doom 2 um, right oh no that was earlier than that it was eight months <laughs> <laughs> so but like so okay so doom is your massive hit for it and, and like you yeah. know bigger than keen bigger than wolfenstein bigger, um, yeah. what was it like designing the sequel to one the at i mean you know the greatest I, I don't i don't mean to stroke your ego too much dog but like you know this 1994 this, this i gotta say this is probably the the greatest fps of you know the 90s you know definitely the most important so how do you follow that up and i mean to drop a press release to say like heads up guys we're gonna drop it the best <laughs> game of the year and then you know a few months later be like yeah we're gonna do it again so what was the pressure like when when you were developing doom 2 well, the funny thing is, like, we never had pressure when we we're making our games. Like, we we were going to make what we wanted. And the fact that when we put our games out, people loved them and bought them reinforced the fact that we need to make our decisions the same way. We need to keep on making games that we personally love playing. So that doesn't put really a lot of pressure on us. We just need to make sure that we're true to those ideals. So when we were... Uh, deciding what we're going to do with um with doom 2 we're like obviously this is done right we did this game right, right. so making the sequel we're not going to change anything <laughs> that we did it's critical that it's the same but more right and so the more is like we add to it we don't subtract anything we add to it and so we're like we're making lots of new levels that's gonna be really fun because like making levels it was just like a brand new discipline that we get started, you know, making making these abstract 3D levels is a brand new thing. And now we're excited to make more of them and better in Doom 2. Yeah. That's cool. We need more monsters. We had a very limited monster palette in the first game. So we needed to add a whole bunch more monsters that would make it more interesting when we put them in specific combinations in these levels where the player has to watch out for heat seeking rockets, but then this monster that that resurrects enemies and all that stuff. So new monsters, new levels, uh, we can split it up into, um, we can make it one big bunch of levels in a row instead of right. episodes. Um, so that was a cool way to kind of separate maybe pieces that were like each other. Um, but uh, adding the, the the shotgun was pretty important, like making sure yeah. that we could put <laughs> another weapon in there. And we all knew like we have to, Put another shotgun in here that's even better and we're like we already overloaded the fist and the chainsaw so let's overload the regular shotgun and the super shotgun so that was important um so we did that and it was like that's enough let's make this thing and get done so it was eight months of leisurely work basically uh getting <laughs> getting the new work. monsters in yeah. <laughs> yeah well there was so much else going on there was so yeah. like i was i was working on heretic Right, right, right. You were working with Raven, uh, Raven yeah. Software too. 
Um, and uh, it's so funny. These the shotgun is like I think like one of the first tests of any first person shooter today. You got the shotgun, and how good does that feel when you when you get a hit? Um, but um, so you guys uh um are killing it obviously right and you're going from wolf from keen to wolf to doom and doom two that's like one of the one of the greatest uh kill streaks win streaks uh, uh in that no one's ever seen something like this and then you one up yourself again with quake now that's quake comes a few years later uh and i have another fun little uh snippet of a uh, review from our october 1996 uh simply put quake is a very good single player action game but it's by far the best most addictive multiplayer action game we've ever played earned the five stars again another like wow this is the, you've done it again in software <laughs> but um we know now that um the development wasn't exactly the smoothest ship you know and it eventually led to your departure from id so i mean can you tell us about that and like just kind of like going from Doom 2 to Quake and sort of the, the the lessons you learned and kind of some of the hardships that happened. This was a pretty major yeah. breakup in the game industry terms, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, thanks for <laughs> thanks for that. And I just want to say, <laughs> I was kidding about leisurely. Like, we work so hard all the time. Oh, no, especially, I believe it. I totally. <laughs> you, you're especially just like, after Doom. <laughs> After Doom, the world exploded for us, and so we had to deal with that and make a game or yeah. two. Um, but with Quake, you know, it was, um, you know, it was the first time. Like we just continued making games the way that we'd always made them. At that at the time that that Quake was made, I think we'd made twenty four games or something. Right. So it's like number twenty five. You know, like we're going to continue making games the same way, and we really shouldn't have. We really should have thought, how long would this tech take to make? Because that was the critical question. Right. Um, and that was the reason why eventually, uh, it didn't work out, you know, uh, us staying together was just, it was stress the whole team out, um, because we thought we were making one thing and it ended up that we weren't making that thing. And, uh, and so while we're trying to make the game, um, the technology changed eight times majorly during the development. And at the end, when it was finally like, this is the sp- this is the game engine and this is the speed that it can go at, which means all the level pieces that we had made need to be redone because we can make it them even better than we did. Um, at that point, there was so much R&D that it happened for a whole year that the team wasn't ready to like do R&D in uh, the design space because I personally wanted to make a really innovative 3D game that wasn't just gun shooting like an right. FPS. I wanted to, to try something else out and if it didn't work, you know, if it didn't work, then we would go back to, to doing a shooter. But um, it was, you know, it was first a massive, massive effort to write that engine specifically, because that engine is doing so much hard work um, defining a full 3D world and the data that that's required for that. And not not, not just that, doing it in multiplayer with a client server architecture right. and rendering it all to the screen like super fast. And, you know, and also while we're, while, while that technology was being developed, not, not like solidifying it in stone and like, well, we can't change this now because we've taken four months or something, but like we can rewrite the whole thing at any point if something ends up not being, not going well, because we were always, you know, always about making the best technology right. that's high speed. So that was, you know, that was really important in getting to the point where we were going to now make the game was just like the team was ready to just like, Let's make a shooter. We don't want to think about what possible designs we could do. And so that was, um, so that for me was just like, uh, you know, that's why I'm here is to like try new things and do new stuff. And so I decided, you know, that I would leave after Quake. Um, But, you know, like we were, you know, we were, we were, we're really young. I mean, we're in our twenties. We, we really should have done something different. Um, And, uh, you know, in, 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 in basically like, made a game that was less technically uh you know uh, ambitious maybe made two games with that technology right. or had part of the team making a game with the prior prior technology and 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 then doing the rest of quake later right. but um you know like with the engine uh you know i, I talked to carmack about all this stuff 
you know, while I was uh, doing, you know, making the book. And, uh, and so he, you know, he agrees, we really should have thought about this better. Right. And we would have had a totally different outcome in how we would have gone forward with Quake instead of making a monolithic, huge jump in technology all over the place. But like, as you can see, you know, <laughs> nothing, nothing is crazy for Carmack. Making that engine <laughs> wasn't crazy. It was critical for us to be on top, you know, yeah. and he knew what it took. And, you know, he's the greatest, you know, game, greatest programmer that the game industry has ever seen. Um, we just didn't know how long it was going to take. It was going to get done. We just right. didn't know when. Right. Um, and, and no even, one had written even rules now, up to that part. You no know? one had written rules, but even now, making an engine in a year, nobody could yeah, do that. That's impossible. Yeah. <laughs> and that that technology leap too, in like the mid nineties, uh, you know, it's un- you couldn't keep that workflow going. It was unsustainable for sure. Yeah. And, it, and you I, know, the team was tired. Sorry, the team was just tired. We had amazing success with Doom and Doom Two, and they just wanted to get the game done. And the team was just so used to going 100 miles an hour. They just didn't want to spend a whole other yeah. year on a game. So you guys were literally suffering from success. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it turned out great still, you know, even even so. We did the best that we could with the state of the team at that time. And still, I think we made something that was good. I made mean, something that as important as Wolfenstein and Doom. And, and, and when you talk about, like, Quake, you guys, Quake kind of spawned from something totally different. Like, the idea of of I guess not not Quake as it turned out, but the character of Quake or and and that that concept started years prior, right? Uh, it spawned out of a Dungeons and Dragons game. Yeah, yeah. The 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 game was going to be like a medieval game. We didn't know exactly what it was going to be, but I was thinking more of a three D fighting type game. Yeah. That you know that that was like hand to hand melee. Maybe you know, your 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 Thor like hammer because that's what quake in our D campaign had this a mass you know massive hammer um so it was very much the the view of what the game was was very different than what we shipped originally it was something totally different right it was on covers of magazines it was everybody knew what the design was back then because we talked about it openly on irc with lots of people for a year right. you know for, for the whole year um but uh you know the when you you d- games change in development all the time this just ended up being a major change, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> people thinking like if you're making a racing game, your team is known for making racing games. And then it's like, well, it's a flight simulator, everybody. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what How it would probably would have been like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, you know, it did turn out well, it turned out, it turned out well, but um, you know, we, we know that we should have, we looked through, you know, we talked about it. We should have really just like talked about the planning of the game. Right. Uh, and that it may have, take too long so what else what else can we do to kind of keep this going but i'm very happy with how the game turned out i think that it was even as a single player game it is scary it's a scary game yeah. with that music in there uh if you play it with the music awesome um so really good uh single player game but multiplayer you know was just you know internet client yeah. server dedicated servers uh master server lists it was just like the beginning of pure internet gameplay, yeah. but it was also the end of the original id. And I, you know, speaking of the sound, um, because Quake soundscapes uh, it's are some of the coolest, I mean, today, I, I just put on Quake before this interview, I was, you know, I got a Quake on the Xbox, and, I, and just like the, the, the kind of like swirling industrial sounds and stuff like that, and yeah. I mean, you, you employed Trent Reznor, the Nine Inch Nails, uh, lead singer and so i want to ask john when did you i i know that maybe prior to this you realized how important sound was to your games but you know when was it th- when did you realize that like we needed like sound we needed the sound to be as advanced as the tech we're pushing you know as the engine you know so i've was. i have always been the sound person um in in, in our you know, basically in our company. I do the sound for most of our games because mm-hmm. to me it's massively important that sound is that sound is great because it immerses you in the game. Right. You need to, you know, you, you you should be able to close your eyes and know what's happening from the sound. Like that's how good it should be. So um, you know, when we were uh doing Wolfenstein even, it was important that we had a digital talking uh, you know, digital audio at right. the time when those cards are just barely coming out. It was critical 
So, um, so we were always trying to innovate and with, with, uh, with doom and doom two and heretic and Hexen, those games were still MIDI. So with quake, it was like digital audio. It's going to be MP3. It needs to be waves or whatever. Right. So we can make any kind of music. And in during 1990 1995, while we're making it, um, we, American basically was thinking about it. I was like, why can't we have <laughs> nine inch nails do our music? Because <laughs> that's exactly what this game should feel like is that, yeah. that disturbing sound. And uh, and when he came to me, he went over to American, talked to John Carmack, and then they both came out and said, guess what? You know, we think it would be really cool to have nine inch nails do the soundtrack. And I'm like, but not with lyrics. But disturbing, yeah. yes, you know, industrial, <laughs> yes, that would be really cool. And and it was like, all right, we're gonna try, we're gonna try and see what we can do. And so we talked to Jay. This is all within five minutes. <laughs> we go talk to Jay and tell Jay, hey, can you get in touch with them? Jay calls up um, ICM in Hollywood, which is an agency. Find out that ICM, who was our agent at that time, uh -huh. they were also the agent for Nine Inch Nails. So our and our <laughs> our agent there. Bill Block was their agent. So he just contacted us and he found out, oh yeah, they play they play Doom on their tour bus all the time. Like they have a four player setup on the tour bus. They love Doom. So it was really it actually wasn't hard to get them to want to to help make the you know do the music for the game. Yeah. So American was kind of put put into because he loved Nine Inch Nails. So he was he was like, here's a gift. You get to interface with Trent Reznor. Right and Chris Brenna and do handle getting the music done. So that's what American was doing. That's nuts. And also, you mentioned American. I, I one of my favorite things about reading your book is uh, how you've come in contact with people who would like you know eventually become you know kind of like important influential people in their own right. I mean, American McGee, Warren Spector, uh, um, Gabe Newell, and John Carmack. Obviously, you know, like all these guys yeah. kind of coming by and just like. You know, at the time, you're just like, whatever, that's American, you know? Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but so post id, uh, and, you know, again, a lot has been written about um, uh, this part of your uh, career. And I, I hope we're not getting in touchy ground or anything, because I want to talk about, um, uh, you know, Dai Katana, your next um, adventure. Yeah. So, um, now, Die Katana um, is definitely not a game that's as uh, beloved as Doom, Wolfenstein, or Quake. Uh, it earned two stars in our PC Mag review <laughs> and I, <laughs> back in 2000. But um, you've gone on the record of saying, you know, Die Katana is uh, a cherished memory of yours. It was like developing that gave you freedom that you felt you were lacking when you were developing quake so i mean tell us about that and tell us you know kind of what was it like because um because i know daikatana's development didn't start as uh easy as you probably would have wanted well yeah it was um so it's not touchy at all to talk about daikatana because i've, I've <laughs> I done always it for feel a like long it's like, time you know, talking about like you know an ex-girlfriend or something you know <laughs> like your breakup yep. with id john <laughs> not a problem not a problem because it was really important to make that game you know iron storm was was uh the the company that came out of you know the result of me wanting to start another company that right. could like actually focus on making more games than one at once and have other great designers in the company making those games um and that was like the big idea around iron storm and i just had to find the right publisher to team with to do that and i spent six months trying to find the right publisher and finally ended up with idos as the perfect partner they were just incredible um, but, you know, in making games and making companies, uh, there's a lot of things that happen in game development. There's a lot of things that happen in people's lives while that's happening. Um, I really did the best I could do running, uh, you know, running a company as much as I could and the team. And um, sometimes that was good. Sometimes I made good decisions and did cool stuff. Sometimes I didn't make good decisions. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it was it was uh, it was experimental but it was also important for me to try to make the things that i wanted to make um yeah. and uh and so even though daikatana didn't turn out to be this really great game i learned a lot from all the failure right. during that time um but i've been i mean really, i mean i've been super fortunate in making games i'm i'm not worried <laughs> about daikatana I, in fact like people will remember one of my biggest failures 
<laughs> yeah, and, forever, and, you know, right? <laughs> no, totally. And I, I, who, a lot of people can't say that. And also, and and I mean, when you're talking about, you know, great, it, great um, decisions and not so great decisions, that ad campaign. Uh, you know, oh, I, yeah. I, I don't, I don't even know if I could curse. I don't think I've ever had a reason to curse on the pilot, so I'm not going to repeat it. But if you if you don't know what I'm talking about, you know, just Google Daikatana ad. And that was such a bizarre ad, but it's so funny. It's indicative of like this a gaming in the 90s or in the late 90s, too. You know, it's very like edgy and very ridiculous. Um, to the point of absurdity, but also kind of gross. But like talk talk about a little bit about how that came to be. Well, just, you know, the ad was just a bad mistake. <laughs> you know, the less said about I, it, the I better. Have to, I have to shine the light on you, John. <laughs> it did not hit the mark. And it's important not to insult your fans. You know, like that yes. top line shouldn't happen. So you shouldn't come up with ads that like insult people. And so it was just, it was a bad idea and it shouldn't have happened. <laughs> But you know what? We'll leave it at that. I think we'll, we'll put the poster up so we don't have to repeat it. So yeah. Save us both <laughs> the cringe. But um, but so um, your time in Ion Storm was a little it was, it was rough, but necessary. And you know, failure. You know, people have to fail to c- continue creating. And um, after Ion Storm, you know, and the failure of Daikatana, you definitely weren't like, you weren't dissuade for making games. You continued to make games, and in fact, you 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 pivoted. You went to a totally other genre. You know. And you started exploring um, social games and mobile games. And um, do you think your eye for design has changed and over the years? And how how is like how is your time spent with first person shooters informed how you view other genres of games and vice versa, maybe? Well, I've <clears throat> kept I mean, I'm so interested in design and I've kept current with all design stuff, which is really important. Um, I'm so inspired by the indie community and the games that they make, you know, creating new genres and and um, just the the imaginations of all the indies out there are super, super inspiring to me. And they all get incorporated into a design sensibility that I have. So my design sensibilities, obviously... There's core sensibilities that I have about like games should be super fast. They should be snappy. They should be responsive. They should be fun. They should sound amazing. You should be immersed. Like there's a lot of core stuff. And then there's a lot of really cool uh, stuff that, that that's around that, that hasn't like solidified, but it's a lot of design thought based off of all the cool indie stuff that I play. It's like, that is a cool idea coming up with a mode where you can do this, right. or that's a really good idea and you UI to, to do these things. And then, just there's so much in design, you know, and uh, and I just I keep on top of all of it and it all gets incorporated into whatever the latest game is that I'm making. You know, it's like got to be got to have the latest ideas. You got to think years ahead for when your game gets done, that you have put something out there that is hopefully where people are game game wise, gameplay wise, right. like they will respond to this thing. Right. And the bigger the game, the longer, the further out you have to see. Right. You got to show them what they don't know they want, but but not too far Basically. ahead so they don't get it. <laughs> exactly, exactly, yeah. Um, and I mean, uh, John, how how cool is it to work uh, with your family on games? Because I you've worked with your son and your wife on on a bunch of different games. I mean, I, I'm fortunate enough to uh, run your own uh, studio, but also you know with family members and stuff like that. What's it like um, working with your family? Do you? Uh, you ever get frustrated? It's, I know Brenda's on the other side here. So it's great. No, it's been super fun. I mean, four of our six kids have been in game dev. Uh, they've worked at our company for years. Um, you know, or the the oldest son has been in the industry for 14 years yeah. as a programmer. Um, the youngest guy designed his own game, got himself in the Wall Street Journal and Venture Beat and everything. You know, like they've been they've been instrumental in helping us uh handle all the stuff at the company and design cool stuff design cool you know games um that we've made and and are still you know out there for download yeah. um so yeah they, they they've learned a lot we love working with them it's super fun and uh you know it's i mean what, what, yeah. what else can you say it's like why wouldn't you want to work with your family no super, exactly great and I, I mean, uh, John, you are, I, I, we're getting a red light. So I want to, I just ask you just quick questions. Um, 
you announced last year that you are working, you are returning to F and you've returned to FPS, uh, FPS games. Uh, you uh, created Sigil, uh, returned to Doom after all those years. But yeah. um, you are working on a new FPS. You announced it last year. In fact, I think almost a year or just a little over since. Um, any updates on that? I know that it's running an Unreal Engine 5, but is there anything new you can tell us about it? A name, uh, what it's going to be? Is it going to revolutionize? Is it going to blow our minds? Are you going to send that? Is this your press release letting, you, letting me know, hey, when it comes out? Uh... It's a John Romero game. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's it. Um, and we have a, a really great publisher. And uh, <laughs> yeah, that's all I can say about it. Okay, okay. So still, still, um, still. It rapid. is a game. It is a game. It is a game and it's a John it Romero has, game. It has game systems in it. <laughs> and it's a, is... a gory John Romero game. These... Oh, gory. Okay. So, I mean, I would have assumed it, but I'm glad. That, this is a scoop, John. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and um, John, I guess, you know, um, uh, what would you say to game designers and game programmers today who are um you know may, they didn't come up in the wild west of the 80s and and stuff like that it, it wasn't as simple as putting something together in a month and then you know no one had ever seen a game like this before you know so uh, what what advice would you give people that are kind of like you know getting themselves together or trying to get themselves out there that basically there are so many different jobs in the game industry even working on games Choose something that you feel that you're going to really like, you know, try it. If you don't like it, try something else. The game industry, you know, it's just so much fun to, to make something that you can think of or to work on something that you feel is great. So just start making games. Just start on it. Just start investigating it and kind of moving a little bit forward. Set, set a little goal for yourself that has to do with games, even if it's just contributing to somebody else's little indie game. Um, just get some experience and just start making stuff. And, it, you know, you don't need to be a programmer to make games. Go find a programmer and work with them to make something. Because I'm right. guaranteed a programmer is going to love having somebody who can do art or writing or sound. Right, for right. So um, everything that you need to learn is online, uh, including tons of communities of people who are just starting out that would love to join your little team. Well, thank you so much, John. It, you know, it's a pleasure to speak to, obviously, like a, a you know, John Romero, but, you know, a fellow Latino in the industry as well. So I'm I'm happy. I'm glad you stopped by and I'm glad we got to talk about your book, uh, Doom Guy, My Life in First Person. Get that there. Um, I hope you liked you know, it. <laughs> I loved it. And uh, you know, you know what? It can, if I could get another copy, like the physical, because I, I already have the galley or the uh, but, yeah. Um, no, thank you so much, John. I I love the book, and uh, if if you're interested in games, games history, uh, development, or you know any of the games John has made, please go out and grab a copy. But thank you, John, for uh, hanging out with us. And well, thank um, you. Yeah, and thank you guys for watching. Uh, hope to see you guys soon. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>